Welcome to the latest edition of Simon and Whiten, the podcast at the intersection of business, media, and politics. I'm Christian Whiten, former diplomat, former finance guy, joined as always by co-host Mark Simon. Say hello, Mark. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Great. Okay. Let's start off with Evergrande, which has been in the news a lot. Mark, this is right up your alley since you've done business in East Asia for decades. Um, giant Chinese real estate conglomerate, among other things, uh, supposedly worth $300 billion, but maybe much more. Who knows? We're never really sure when you're hearing from China. Um, this put the real scare into our markets on Monday. A huge decline, big time speculation. Will the Chinese bail this out? Won't they? That still continues. Um, and, you know, this is a huge part of the Chinese economy. People plowing money into condos they haven't seen, don't own, won't see for a couple of years. Um, Phantom cities reportedly in China. I've never known if that's really true or not of, uh, you know, based on real estate speculation. Some people saying this is the Lehman Brothers for China. Others saying, well, no, it's not a big deal. Um, where do you think we should we should make of this? I mean, what's the risk that we're, we're, we're facing with China? Uh, and what's the risk of contagion of this really tanking U.S. markets, which by any estimate are, are pretty radically overvalued? Well, first of all, let's start with Evergrande. Evergrande exists because it's a politically connected, very well politically connected in, in, um, company. Um, they have $300 billion right now that we know of in liabilities that they apparently don't have any money for. Now, the one reason why we think it's probably more than $300 billion is because anytime you say $300 billion, if it wasn't $300 billion, they'd tell you it was $250 so that they're accepting $300 billion and that it is communist China, I think we can count on it being a lot more. How they solve this, look, they can just print money. They're going to force people to take haircuts left, right, and center. They are going to probably go out and gauge, okay, we're a country of 1.4 billion people. If we're going to have three or 400,000 people really upset, across China to the point where we're going to have to arrest a few of them, we can handle that. So I think, yes, China will survive Evergrande. However, will the real estate system in China survive Evergrande? In other words, at this point in time, people are taking some major losses all across the board. We keep hearing Evergrande, Evergrande, Evergrande. But there are dozens of other very large developers, Soho, Seneca, and even in Hong Kong, Henderson Land, Sung Hung K, who are taking hits right now. <laughs> the question is really to me is, will, how big is the contagion? There's no doubt in my mind it's going to continue to spread and spread. People are going to have to take assets they don't want to take. And we've got this overriding thing in everybody's mind. Everybody knows this. Demographics, demographics, demographics. There are not enough babies in China. There are not enough people coming into the workforce. The death rate is rising every year because of the age of people. What is happening is there's just not the need that they have in the past for new apartments, new, new property. So... The question is, why is it going to continue to grow? And it's not going to. And when you have, I don't know, people say 18, 23 percent of the economy value is locked up in property. It starts going like that. It is ex also one thing we have to remember. And this is so important. The democracies, whether it's Japan, the U.S., Canada, U.K., any place, democracies basically have a fail safe system. In other words, they can fail. You can fail in the democracy and then move on to the next thing. You can fail in free markets and open markets and have a new thing. I'm not sure that we've ever seen a totalitarian regime have a failure the size of Evergrande and it just keeps on going like nothing happened. There's going to be some changes. I'm not smart enough to tell you what the changes are going to be. But, you know, there's a great article in Bloomberg today to give them a plug about how in 2016, the Hong Kong financial regulators who need to be looked at seriously for this. In other words, international, can you trust these guys for what they did and what the great Bloomberg article, they basically chased a hedge fund off Evergrande. The guy was telling Evergrande, he was calling it a bucket of bolts and it was nothing there. And the Hong Kong government went after this guy, Hong, this regulator. 
What if this guy would have been allowed to do what he was allowed to do? Maybe we wouldn't have the Evergrande problem today. That's the lesson of democracy we take away from that. The Chinese, I'm not sure they take that lesson away. I think Evergrande is going to basically reverberate through the system for years. A lot of people are going to lose a lot of money and they're not going to be happy. And I see no sector in the private, in the property market that is worth investing. That's why when I, mm-hmm. when I see people like Blackstone or Ray Diallo or <laughs> other people right, right, right. talking about how this could be a good thing for China, there was some <laughs> idiot in the Wall Street Journal today saying this could be a good thing in the long run. Yeah, okay. You know, maybe it's a good thing if somebody dies in an apartment and then somebody else gets to move into the apartment. For them, that's good. But for the person that died, it's not the greatest thing in the world. So who's, whose is it? You know, who, whose value is it? I myself do not see any chance of anything good coming out of this other than the Chinese Communist Party coming under a lot of pressure. Right. And that would be the ultimate uh, upside. It's, it's so different than the U.S. and what people I think are expecting, which just isn't going to happen. You know, if you look in the U.S., an orderly corporate bankruptcy process, whether, whether it's a restructuring or a liquidation, you go to court, the equity holders get wiped out. The uh, bondholders take a haircut. There's a creditors committee. The management is replaced. And then you go on from there. Nothing like that seems to happen. And, you know, as to the question of contagion, I went back and looked at the Asian financial crisis. This is beyond, of course, the memory of, of, of a whole lot of people, right, yeah. today, including, yeah, including the media. But 1997, uh, you have Southeast Asia, fundamentally pretty sound economies, but the Thai bought the Thai um, liquidity crisis. They couldn't um, afford the peg for their currency. So they floated it, it devalued it, and it set off this cascade of effects. I'm sure you felt this very much in Hong Kong. Uh, that, even though there was pretty limited exposure in the United States to Southeast Asia, caused um, you know about a 12% decline in the market, more than 7% one day, and a, a fair amount of economic drag across Southeast Asia, despite fast-growing economies, some of which Singapore had rule of law, it caused a change of government in Indonesia. Now, you know, it just tells us again that uh, uh, will turbulence in China like this be the thing that finally pops the bubble in the United States when everyone is sort of waiting to see if the Federal Reserve does it? Uh, It's an interesting question. Turning back one other element of this in China, as you say, um, uh, how can a catastrophic, a catastrophe you know, occur and the CCP not have some big problems. The CCP, their whole sort of unwritten mantra is uh, just, you know, trust us, give us all the power. We're dictators, but we're going to gradually increase the economic power and wherewithal and well-being of China. If that goes out the window, my question for you is, you know, Xi Jinping has made this left turn. Uh, he's put people like Jack Ma through the ringer, um, you know, stuck at two companies that were doing private education, that uh, were trying to put data beyond the reach of the CCP. Um, has he internalized the possibility for economic turmoil? Is he willing to, to take more of that than his predecessors were? I think his desire and his ability for what he wants to do are two different things. I think he desires to basically have everything work in the old Leninist model. I think we have to remember this guy's a Leninist. And so he really does expect to get up and say, I expect egg production to be at a million eggs an hour. And he expects it to happen. Okay. That is what he expects. His ability to control that. I think he's lost that ability. Maybe 25 years ago, you had that ability. Okay. Maybe 25 years ago, you could do that because you controlled everything. They're in a global economy now. You know, they can't push a button and expect something to happen in Indonesia or New York or something like that. So I think he does have real problems here. And I think the problem that he has with the people is that everybody knows that, you know, the king, the emperor has no clothes here. In other words, they know that he can't save them if this starts going downhill. And you do see, in my mind at least, I see it in themes from the main, the mainland media where they blame the U.S. for everything. Even the COVID stuff, when they're blaming us for the COVID stuff, that has nothing to do with the U.S. They do not care one bit that the American people believe that. They are trying to get that message into the Chinese people as, as a way to like show, see, these guys did this to us. This is what happened to us. 
I think you'd be shocked at how many mainland Chinese folks believe this. You know, now I'm not saying that they're the leaders of their country, the, the leaders of the economic set. They probably don't believe it, but it is what gets out there. I think the other thing I'd like to go back to real quick is one of the things we have to remember about the U.S. is in the economic contagion, Bill Clinton was president, but Bill Clinton was a different type of economic president. Bill Clinton was working. It was a free market system. He was a southern southern president. I should say that it's very important to remember. You know, he had embraced Newt Gingrich because he didn't want to get impeached. He was basically moving to the free market. The era of big government was over. So what happened when you had the contagion in Asia and the rest of the world, you had the U.S. aircraft carrier. (laughs) Here's the question. As you start to have the contagion out there, a lot of money, and this is a good case, is going to find its way to the U.S. In other words, because that will be considered a safe haven. But the question is, are we the same economy this time? And maybe we're not. Maybe we're not as strong as we were back then. Maybe we didn't have the leadership that we did back. We, we don't have the leadership we did back then. I think it's an open question for the U.S. economy. And I do think that the other risk that we have is there's a lot of Chinese money in the U.S. And when Xi Jinping starts pointing his fingers at people and saying, you come here and you come here and you pay this and you pay that, I think there'll be a lot of things in the U.S. sold for them to come back. In other words, so there, there could be a fire sale. If they have to cover, if they have to cover multiple different things, guess what they're going to cover? Unfortunately, that's my dog. He just said hello to everybody. But um, <laughs> dog agrees. My the dog. dog my dog agrees. My dog is a capitalist. But <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that so I I I think Christian, because you know what you said, I I really thought that was very interesting. You know, ninety seven. It was a different time. It does it all, always mean it's the same time? And, and that's why I just look at people and go, maybe it's not the same time here. But Xi Jinping, his his desires to do things and his abilities are completely different things. Completely different things. Right. All right. Well, let's. Uh, you know, it's a great point. Switching gears here. You know, I was looking um, Darden Restaurants, uh, which operates Olive Garden. Uh, I think among other properties. So you know, I'm I'm a skeptic of valuations, especially of technology companies and all the high flyers today. So I'm looking for a more ho hum um, company. You come across Darden Restaurants and uh, 21 billion dollars market cap on seven billion in sales. That's that still strikes me as a little bit pricey historically for a chain of restaurants. Price to earnings of 33. That's not quite so bad. I'd you know be more comfortable if it were down closer to 20. Um, they pay this crazy thing called the dividend, 2.76 percent. They actually make money, as I mentioned. Um, you know, what do you make of a company like this? And, um, you know, the headwinds that we've seen so far, especially this year, and they seem to be persisting despite, you know, uh, a supposed return to normalcy, which is just the inability of, of anyone in the service industry seemingly to get an adequate <clears throat> amount of, of labor. And, you know, what are you, what are you saying? Well, you're, you're hitting right on it. You're hitting right on it. I mean, I'm, just so everybody, full disclosure, everybody knows I actually, you know, oversee your hotel and restaurant group in Canada, um, you know, when we've got close to a thousand employees, but we don't have enough, you know, I mean, we have a thousand slots, I should say, we need a thousand employees, we don't have enough. This is what everybody has. I have many restaurant friends, I have a lot of people there. there. Here's the advantage that Darden restaurants have. They're up and they're running, okay, and they have to tweak their personnel system to get people in. The barrier to entry for a new restaurant right now is pretty significant. First of all, you've got the labor problem. It's hard to find people. I mean, Shake Shack down the road, if you've been at Shake Shack for more than a year, you're making $16.75 an hour, plus benefits, okay? Walmart and Amazon are dragging people in left, right, and center, okay? They're begging people to work for them. The type of person that works in the food and beverage industry has essentially a lot of options now so if you're looking to start a restaurant if mark if you and i wanted to start a restaurant up we got to have a lot of capital because we got to hire people away from what are good jobs now you know the days of the television stories you know where you see the jerk boss and everybody's like you know everybody's nasty or something like that or nobody everybody hates their boss there are no jerk bosses anymore you can't have a boss who's a jerk if you're an owner it doesn't happen, okay? You can't have that. If you have that, you're not going to have any employees. 
People walk out the door. It's one of the things I tell, I hate to say it. I hope I don't get a lot of letters. Says, it's the problem that old people are having now in our restaurants and other people. They show up and they say, oh, I need better service and I need this and that. And you're looking at them going like, I'm sorry, we don't have enough employees to come by your table three times you know, every 10 minutes to check and make sure you're doing okay. This is the level of service that's going to be provided. By the same token, we always see, you know, a police officer goes into Starbucks and somebody writes pig on the cup or somebody writes something mean, you know, it's nasty. And then there's an outrage on the Internet. You should fire everybody, fire everybody. <laughs> the problem is <laughs> most of the employees are probably in on the joke. You fire the guy who did it. All the others of them walk out and you're not serving coffee. So. The power of the employee now is significant. So when I talk, when I'm looking at someone like Darden, I fully agree. A 30% valuation on that company is ridiculous. And the reason why is people are going to figure out how to do this differently. I picked up something from Chip Olay for my daughter now. They are not even trying to service you in the restaurant. They basically get a bag and leave, get a bag and leave, get a bag and leave. OK, mm -hmm. hotels now, as you know, we both go to D.C., we both go to New York City. You're in there. You know, there's no such thing as room service. There's a bag. <laughs> there's a there's a brown bag <laughs> that's dropped off at your thing with two plastic forks. And that's in a, that's in like a Westin or someplace nice like that. There's nobody pushing a cart around like the way they used to. So we're going to see it. We're going to see a lot of different things happening. But, Kristen, you know, my point would be this. If somebody's actually making money and you're getting a dividend of 2.76%, it's not the worst stock in the world. I'd, I'd, I'd take a look at it. But a 30% P&E, the only thing that justifies that to me is the barrier to entry. This is a company that does do $7, 8000000000 billion a year in revenue. There's not many people like that out there in the restaurant business. You know, and by the way, I don't like their restaurants that much either. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, the Olive Garden is just, you know, ugh. but the fact of the matter is, but the fact is they've got it. You know what I'm saying? They've got it down. But, right, it's, right. but, but, but the barrier to entry to restaurants, I mean, I, I tell people all the time now, if you really wanted to make money as a young person, I'll be honest, if you got three or four of your buddies and you guys opened a pretty good place, you know what I'm saying? You did a good job with the food. You'd be fine. You'd be making money hand over fist. Hmm. Interesting. Well, it's funny, you know, we were all told a year or two ago, you know, before COVID, the big fear was that robots and mechanization would put all of these people out of work and they would all have to be on the uh, universal basic income, basically, you know. Uh, hey, you're right. Have well. you ever seen have you ever seen an idea that just did not age well? I mean, poor, you know, Yang is one of the nicest guys out there. I've, I've shook him the guys. Shake, I've met the guy a couple of times. I haven't talked to him too much. But he's just a nice, decent man. You know what I'm saying? And all the tech guys are, oh, we have to have universal basic income. And you cannot. You're, I just drove, I just drove um, to Philadelphia the other day. And I must have counted 20 billboards with name, people up on the, you know, please come to work for us. You know what I'm saying? We need this. We need that. Same thing happened when I was going north in New York. Not enough people. In fact, yeah. I know I know a guy outside of Buffalo who wanted to open a food processing place. Couldn't do it. Couldn't get the workers. Won't won't be able to get them. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm happy because you know backup plan. I know how to wait tables. I don't know how to code. So uh, I'm glad to know <laughs> that there's you know something out for me. All right. Switch different uh, different part of the economy now. The movie business. Uh, there's a new James Bond movie coming out. It's been delayed time and time again throughout the pandemic. Uh, director, a man named Kerry uh, Fukunaga. Uh, Kerry's a dude. Carry with the C. Um, he said he came out and preempted. I think this was an act of preemptive woke insurance seeking. I don't know if it'll work. He came out and said that Sean Connery um, was basically a rapist and and sort of disavowed the whole uh, legacy of James Bond as someone who was not adequately um, woke and in tune with with the, uh, the ghost know. of Sean Connery is going to come down and kick his ass. <laughs> That's right. I mean, come well, on. And the I flip mean, side of this was Daniel Craig, who, you know, current actor, this is his last Bond film, basically, I think, saved the franchise from this yeah, over gadgetry, no plot, product placement sort of disaster. And, and um, you know, 
brought it back. But anyway, he came out and said, shockingly, the James Bond should be a man. We'll see if the Wokistas go after him. Uh, you know, God forbid we should maybe think that uh, Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond, had him as a male Scottish orphan. And that was a key part of his identity and what drew him to this. But anyway, you know, what do you make of the director? And and, and is he going to, is he going to, is he going to succeed in fighting off the Wokistas? You know, I, it's such a cowardly thing that he did. That's so cowardly. You know, you've got a dead guy who, quite frankly, I mean, was there ever an accusation like this? He's, you know, he, he's Sean Connery. He's a man of his time, a man of his period. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure he's not going to get the feminist of the year award, you know, but, or ever was going, I don't think he cared if he got it either, but you know, you attack a guy like that, but here's the whole thing. You're exactly right. The whole identity of, of, of this orphan thing is so important because how else could you live the life and become as hard as you come? Daniel Craig's a great James Bond because he's a killer. James Bond is a killer. You know, how long did David Nevin last as James Bond? One, one movie. You know what I'm saying? Roger Moore was okay, but he was only good when he was actually mad. Sean Connery was fantastic. You know, Pierce Bronson, eh, you know. Daniel Craig is right. The fact of the matter is, what we want is we want a guy who's fighting. You know, it's kind of like saying, having John Wick. How do you have a female John Wick? Have you ever watched John Wick 3, the fights that he has? Are we supposed to suspend imagination that women are able to fight like that? Why, why do we have to constantly, constantly, why do we have to constantly have these lies in our society to make everybody feel good? No, women cannot fight as well as men. It's just a physical thing. It's what it is. Ask Ronda Rosie. She'll tell you, ask MMA fighters. They'll tell you, no, I can't go around. I can't go 10 rounds with a guy. It doesn't happen. James Bond is really, to be honest with you, the sex stuff is, you know, that left with Roger Moore. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I mean, now it's kind of bad. Daniel Craig is like a one woman man in the whole movie. Is that like a girlfriend or something like that? You know, that's mm -hmm. the font. But he's, yeah. think about it. But I mean, what what remember that great rundown scene that Daniel Craig has where they're running through this African place, you know, and he's chasing this guy. This and this guy's like a, just an acrobat and he's having to crash through doors or something like that. Matthew, Bo I mean, Jane, born can born. Why do we have to pretend? And here's my whole thing: Who is the person at the movie company that comes up with this? You know who it is? It's somebody who's got a lot of money. It's somebody who's not worried about their next paycheck, and it's someone who doesn't care. Right. They are more they are more worried about this. You know, it's it's kind of like Ghostbusters, the, the oh. female Ghostbusters. Oh god, yeah. You know what the worst thing about that female Ghostbusters was? Actually, mm -hmm. it could have been good. I mean, it, the, I, I read a really good review. The actresses are solid. The actresses are good, but they tried to make it a girl movie, a women power movie. You know what I'm saying? They could have made it completely different because you. Science. They could have used science against them and all this stuff, but it, it they basically they 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 contrasted it with everything else. My dog's tearing apart the house right now. But <laughs> the thing is, is that so what's happening is I just I think go woke, go broke, but also go woke ruin stuff. I mean, I think when you're in, it's, and when we talk about money and investing and things like that, you know, who's coming up with these things? This is why I believe Netflix is doomed. By the way, I'll give you a thing. Netflix, really? Netflix is doomed until they actually have somebody in that place who's going to pick something that men are going to watch. You know, Greg Gutfeld is, is number one over at Fox now. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you about that because, uh, you know, go woke, go broke. We had this instance last night of all of the late night talk I, show hosts basically deciding they were going to do I know about it but I, I know about it but I didn't watch it and I, I didn't watch, watch it either it. I don't know anyone who what? watched it who? you know Steve who? Yates basically pointed out that late night used to be kind of edgy yes. humor for adults and now it's turned into Sesame Street for adult progressives it's bizarre it can't I mean, possibly be the best yeah. way to make money 
You, I mean, late night was Johnny Carson with Raquel Welch when she had a cat on her lap and she said, we like to pet my pussy. And he said, move the cat. And, you know, <laughs> and, and he almost got thrown off television. He literally almost got thrown <laughs> off television for that. You know, people went crazy. I mean, Letterman. Letterman was funny. Letterman used to be funny. You know, and in fairness to Jay Leno, Jay Leno was quite funny, too. And I, I think, I, I'm one of these guys who really feel like some, everybody feels sorry for Jimmy Fallon. But I decided I don't feel sorry for Jimmy Fallon because you know what? Jimmy Fallon is really, out of all those guys, he's the top guy. Yeah. He's the one. Why, if you're Jimmy Fallon, are you pulling along Samantha B and this other clown from uh, Stephen Colbert? Why are you in this together? Jimmy Kimmel is about to go out the door. Your job is to win. Your job is to work for your company. You know what I'm saying? Your job is to have all those people that, you're, that work for you to be there. What's your differentiation? Oh, we're going to do climate tonight. And the thing is, is like, and, and so this is the point. One of the, one of the best articles I read, and, I, and I'll tell you something. I don't know where the woke people are coming from. I was just up visiting my son at university. So you, when you go there, you see all these, my son's Asian, my son's Chinese. He's with his Hispanic friends. He's with his other buddies. They're going on. I don't think they buy into this stuff. I don't think they do it. And I think, I think the marketing is not going to work. Gutfeld, um, I think, you know, the first 30 minutes of it is fantastic. I enjoy it. You know, I don't really watch much more than that if it, unless, you know, something else on. But I'm just, I just believe that, you know, basically, here's a guy who's number one. What is he number one in? He's number one because he tries to be funny. Right. And, he, and, he has, and he has all these targets to hit. Every day he has these targets to hit. And the question is for these big networks all the time, the big networks is, why are they not adjusting? Part of it is they, they've, drank in the, they've drank the Kool-Aid. The other part of it, you got a bunch of guys my age in their 50s, and all they're saying, you know what I'm saying, is, please, Lord, one more year. Please, Lord, <laughs> one more year. Right. All I want to do is get my kid out of college. All I want to do is retire with my pension. So they're not going to rock the boat because we've still got a system in these companies where some little wokeista can come along, you know, get a group that signs a petition and you've got a CEO who's doing the same thing. I just want two more years to my stock options mature and he'll fire anybody who gets in the way of that. Right. Or she'll fire anybody. I, I think I think the entertainment industry um, is going down. And that's why I think Netflix is going down. the trash that Netflix turns out now. It's awful. Is there really a good Netflix show out there right now? Well, The Crown is their big, their big ah. marquee one, and they spend ah, you know. Well, it's it's so dramatized. I like the political elements. I realize it's BS. The amount of money they spend on that, on the production. I mean, I don't really know that much about production, but I can tell it's a fortune. But uh, and probably because of that, I I wouldn't think. I mean, it's hard to calculate the margin on one of their things because they have a subscription model, and if yep. you buy it, you get it all. Um, but, uh, it, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like it's a, a long-term sustainable. Was so it talking about the business of, um, you know, it's interesting that both Roger Ailes and seemingly Murdoch up until now didn't really buy into the late night model. I mean, um, uh, they sort of, I think they tried something called the half hour news hour, which was yeah. an attempt at comedy. It failed. Um, you know, maybe it just took gut felt demand to, um, to do this, but, uh, well, Bill, you know, I told you once before Bill shine, who was Ailes assistant, I was pitching some stuff to Bill shine and, uh, Bill shine said, Nope, not interested. He said, we got O'Reilly at 11 o'clock. It's a repeat. We come in number five or six, show me something that does that well for free. And then I'll, you know, I'll talk to you about it. I think gut felt was perfectly timed. I think gut felt year two of Trump would not have made it. You know what I'm saying? He, it's, he, he, you, timing's, timing means a lot. And yeah. he's going strong now. And I think the other thing, too, is he could go strong for a while because he seems to understand who to pick, pick on. That's the main thing. <laughs> he, he, he knows. He knows what's and – he, and he's a funny guy. He's, he's actually a personally funny guy. Right. No, it's, that's all, that's all crucial. Okay. One uh, that sort of segues neatly to a final topic briefly, um, which is, uh, let's see, where were we here with, um, with Piers Morgan coming over again to the USA, you know, he was here before at CNN. It didn't really work out. He was kind of preachy on certain left-wing topics, maybe not left-wing enough for 
pointless CNN, but, uh, you know, in favor of things like gun control, uh, just didn't, you know, who wants to hear sort of a stuffy British guy tell us how to govern ourselves. But back in the UK, he's really sort of reached a new higher level, uh, in particular by taking on Meghan Markle, I think one of the biggest frauds out there, married to Prince Harry, taking on, um, you know, the last institution in the Western world that has a fair amount of respect, whether you whether it's the British monarchy or just Queen Elizabeth herself. Anyway, so Murdoch has peers coming over here. I think he uh, has been with the Daily Mail and probably still will be, or maybe they just cover him a lot, but he's going to have a, a, a gig with the New York Post and I guess, you know, speculation that that may also put him on Fox News. Oh, yeah, um, for sure. What do you think about, and it's a like, little footnote about Murdoch business. <laughs> Apparently he put 150 million bucks into Theranos. Anyway, that's a different topic for a different day. But what do you think of this as a business move? I mean, is this going to succeed this time around, this, this version of Piers Morgan? Here's my thing on Piers Morgan. I think Piers Morgan is a font to the, get ready, the angry moderate white man <laughs> that's what I call it. the angry moderate white man it's a different thing it's not the guy with the trump flags driving around in the truck it's basically the guy who comes to the office every day he's nice to everybody he's polite but he has to sit down in the room and be lectured how he's a sexual predator in waiting you know what i'm saying or he has to be told that he's not woke enough or he has to find out that he's not going to get that promotion job because they're going to give it to somebody else but you know basically He's an independent. He swings back and forth. Murdoch, I mean, when you, I was thinking about this when we first talked about it a while ago. Morgan appeals to those people. You know, he's intellectual enough. He's a very smart guy. But he's also tabloid enough. He's a tabloid guy. That's his training. People forget that. I'm a tabloid guy, you know, with Apple Daily. We have a different way of looking at things. We like the splash. We like to hit things hard, you know. But really, if you think about it, who's he out to appeal to? He's not out to appeal to like the people, you know, who watch, uh, you know, Fox Morning and they're, you know, God bless America and all that stuff. They'll roll him out there. But what he is going to do is, I mean, I can really see him appealing to this larger, you know, basically demographic that really is in play right now. And I believe it is. I believe there's a demographic in play. It's multiracial. Okay. And it's it's young men and actually some 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 young young women. I don't know. I can give you the number. They're not rad guys like Trump. Turn them off. They don't like the Trump stuff, but they don't mind an argument. But they're also looking for somebody to champion them a little bit. You know, I, I know it sounds odd to say, but you do see these people in certain things. On the left, there used to be a few people like that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm -hmm. Chuck Todd, for example. I think I think this guy is the guy who's not a cheerleader, but he's he's kind of seen on your he's he's basically on the side of these people, but he's he's basically bright enough that people can kind of endorse him. You know, honestly, quite frankly, Tucker Carlson used to occupy that area for a while. And then he just, you know, Tucker moved far to the right and he became more, you know, he became more, I would say, attack dog on the left. But think about Piers Morgan. All right, I don't, I don't think you ha you're able to own a cannon. All right, but you own your gun. He's not going to make a big deal there. But what, think about Piers Morgan, who has a very good economic mind, by the way. If you actually ever, I've listened to some of his stuff. Think about Piers Morgan talking about, you know, being in the workplace with equity and, and, and diversity and how that impacts people who've had nothing happen to them. Kristen, I think this is a huge political area, but it's really, for me, a more a huge market area. I think Gutfeld actually appeals to that group quite a bit, you know, because Gutfeld's sitting there and all of a sudden he goes, hey, I think heroin should be legal. What? You know, <laughs> you know, and, he, and, and, he, and, he, and I know he believes it. But the yeah. fact of the matter is, it, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, do you remember that show they used to have on Fox with Huckabee? Yeah. You know, uh, every time. Yeah. Every it time goes on that once or twice. Yeah. Oh my God! Every the time the guitar, every, always with the guitar. Yeah, yeah. Every, every every time you'd look at that audience, it was like none of these these people that I probably none of these if these people knew anything about me, they'd never vote for me. I mean, it's like they're nice people, but they you know it's a, right. this Christian Christian to the right group, and that group is not up for play. I think Piers Morgan's probably look the old man Murdoch. I don't understand why. I every time I hear people say something about him, critical of him, I say. That guy has made so much money in one of the hardest businesses there is, right. media. I mean, he's made a lot of money. So it's, it's, it's hard to do some things. Now, I will say this. As a shareholder of, um, 
a shareholder of, uh, of, of News Corp. I will say I, uh, I hope that Piers Morgan helps get that going. Yeah, well, it's uh, I think you're onto something there with just the idea both he and Gutfeld uh, and others like him are, are, you know, they're a little volatile, sometimes unpredictable, but um, they're generally on the side of people fighting the Wokeistas. And that's a huge market opportunity. And as far as the New York Post goes, I, you know, I think this will continue their ascent. They've gone from sort of, you know, a very New York focused player to uh, more of a national brand. I and, think. you know, I and you know what? Of- you know what? I, and I have a personal interest in this that one day we all talk about. But, you know, the Hunter Biden stuff, you know, God bless them. They were right. That stuff just <laughs> came out. I mean, they were right. right. I mean, you know, that that must be I, I, I've, I've you know, I had some peripheral involvement with some of that stuff. And it, it for all the New York Times, Washington Post, even Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal walked away from the New York Post on this one. The news side at least did for all these people. This tabloid got it right. And I don't think it would have changed the outcome of the election. I, I, I think basically everybody knew that, you know, Hunter was basically smoking crack and going out with low class hookers. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that I do think that from a journalism perspective, the idea of protecting him to protect Biden and what they were doing, willing to do to other people was amazing to me. In fact, it changed my opinion completely. It's the one thing that's changed my opinion completely on the rights of people like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. In my mind, they're publishers now. Yes. That was it. They're publishers. They should be sued for what's up there. They got to be held to the same standards as everybody else. Right. This whole that this whole that we're a platform. Your platform, you're like the phone. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the, the phone company is a platform. They, they don't they don't care what people say on the phone. You guys are making decisions. You're a, you're a publisher. You're responsible then. That's right. And frankly, as conservatives, I think we need to uh, dispense with the idea that laissez-faire and that what passes for the free market is going to somehow resolve this and use the power of government to, um, you know, frankly, make life a little harder for these, these you know, extremely left-leaning pro-censorship um, organizations. Could, anyway, could, go ahead. Uh, no, the one thing I was going to say, I think we could have a whole show on it, but we have to look We've got a situation in the capitalist system where we basically have people who've got a lot of money. They're not looking for much more money and they're going to be pushing the left wing agenda. We could talk about Jeff Bezos's wife all day long. (laughs) She's got eight. She's got 40 billion dollars. And, you know, out it goes. Maybe some of us doing a lot of good. I hope it is. But there's people inside organizations and companies that we're trying to invest in. They're not interested in your they're not interested in, in your stock performance. Doesn't mean anything to them. Right. No, they uh, you've gotten to a point where money is almost just numbers on a page and their political agenda is uh, is what comes first. That all is right. all of the uh, time we have for this episode of Simon and Whiten, but we'll be back again with another one real soon. Thank you, Mark.